Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Stankovich. I've been asked uh, to come in and speak to this topic today. I've been uh, working a little bit with OHSAA and the State Attorney General to raise awareness and provide educational content on this growing problem. Uh, prescription pills uh, being um, used and abused by student athletes, not just here in Ohio, but nationwide. And so uh, this was a topic that was very interesting to me to get involved with because I have seen kids firsthand at the practice. I've worked with families who have been exposed to this. And uh, it's, a, it's a really big issue because it's not the kind of problem that kids can generally just walk away from. Uh, there is a very strong physiological component to this that uh, really plays into addiction. So uh, we're going to talk about this today, but let me just introduce myself first. Um, I've been in private practice now for almost 20 years, and I focus on looking at the contemporary psychosocial issues involved in sports. Um, I do write for the Ohio High School Athletic Association's magazines, also the National Federation of High Schools magazines. And one of the things that's been really um, exciting for me over the years is that a lot of the issues I tend to see on the front line uh, at the private practice or interacting with people like yourselves long before these subjects even hit the textbooks or uh, you know kind of hit the numbers at large and just a, a quick overview of some of the subjects in the last 10 12 years that have kind of evolved um, now you're probably all familiar with youth sport burnout well we weren't talking about that you know in the 80s or 90s but now that's kind of common again I was seeing that uh, pretty early on just with some of the families I would see at the practice um, performance enhancing supplements. I know we're going to talk about prescription pain medication today, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, we started seeing increasingly more youth and interscholastic athletes uh, using and abusing various performance enhancing supplements. That became a big problem. Uh, in recent years, we've seen issues around boundaries between adult coaches and minors uh, involved in, in interscholastic and youth athletics long before the Penn State uh, situation. So. These are some of the things that we see and of course we try to respond to them and provide good educational material so that people on the front line can identify and respond uh, more effectively and responsibly. Now that brings us to this topic today of prescription pain medications that are being used and in worst case scenarios kids becoming addicted and going to the street to continue their usage or worse yet turning to the cheaper and more widely available alternative in heroin and uh, again it's kind of difficult right now to ascertain how many kids in Ohio or nationwide are using and abusing these medications but certainly we're seeing a rise and I think if you talk to anybody in sports medicine or anybody involved in sports psychology who has a counseling practice you, they will tell you that they see it uh, increasingly more and one last thing uh, before I kind of get started here with the presentation this is um, very interesting on another level too in that a lot of kids who ordinarily are uh, high achieving academically, socially involved, um, good kids. Uh, this is a, 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 a situation that affects them. Unlike what people traditionally think of with street drugs, and now of course this isn't always true, but you tend to think of the kids falling between the cracks, maybe not involved in things, getting caught up in street drugs. This is a very different uh, situation. We've got kids who come from very good, normal, middle-class homes, uh, they do pay attention to their academic marks, they're involved in social activities, involved in church and community, and they somehow seemingly fall into this trap. And we'll talk a little bit today of how that occurs, but uh, I find it fascinating because I'm thinking about some of the families that I've seen firsthand at my office over the last couple of years. You know, if they were here right now, you would never think of, of these families and these kids being stereotypical, um, you know, at-risk kids that get caught up in some pretty serious stuff. In fact, in all of the situations that I've had in my practice, uh, the youngsters have eventually had to go to um, inpatient treatment because there is such a strong physiological connection to these medications that uh, it becomes too overwhelming and too difficult to simply walk away from. The drug controls them. So uh, that's a little bit about me and, and getting started here. Uh, we'll look at, I'd like to start with looking at today's student athlete. Um, on the next slide, we'll see. Who is today's student athlete? Uh, it's a lot different than even just a few years ago. Um, if you think back to when you were a kid playing sports, uh, we've got some difference in age here, but uh, 
you know, there were a lot more pickup games, there was a lot less intensity. I know we're coming into summer now, it was not uncommon for kids to play maybe 10 or 15 Little League baseball games over the course of a summer. Their uniforms were usually t-shirts with a silkscreen logo on the front, pretty low-key stuff. Uh, today, though, it's very different. Uh, it's different at the youth sport level. It's certainly different at the interscholastic level, as you guys know. And um, a lot of it centers around, or, or what has been created through this, is what we call an athletic identity. And I want to talk a little bit about this because I think it really plays into the, the, the gist of what we're going to talk about today with the, the pain pills. But, you know, we know in research that athletes often cultivate, sometimes consciously and sometimes it's just uh, as a result of being involved in athletics for a long time, they often uh, develop what we call an athletic identity. I don't know if you've ever heard this term before, but if you, if you step back even just looking at identity development, typically our identities are, are formed from two interrelated pieces. You have your self-identity and you have your social identity. And so your self-identity you would think of um, just how would you describe yourself? If somebody uh, were to meet you today and said, tell me about yourself, what would be some of the things that you would talk about? Some of the um, things that you've experienced, characteristics of your personality, um, job endeavors, things like that. Your social identity is how others view you, which may or may not be in concert with how you identify yourself. Now think about how this applies to athletics. You've got student athletes who first and foremost often identify themselves as athlete, and that's very evident. We can walk down the halls of the school right now and we will see countless student athletes wearing t-shirts, hats, coats that just represent their armor. Yeah, okay, they are student athletes at this school. So they identify with being a student athlete, but then their social identity is also that. If you think about it, when you're at the mall or the local pizza shop or wherever you go around town, a lot of times, or if you're a teacher in the classroom, you see the kids come in, you know that he's on the football team, she's on the softball team, and what a lot of teachers will do um, without uh, any ill intent is rather than say, how you doing in Spanish, how'd you do in the softball game last night? How many hits you get? And so, you know, we're not trying to create anything here, but you think day after day, week after week, year after year, all of a sudden you've got this strong athletic identity. And so that's really important to note here because it plays into the lengths that some kids will go in order to get back out on the field quicker. Because that's who they think they are, that's who their school and community at large expect them to be, especially some of your star athletes. And then you throw into the mix, uh, if you're following professional sports these days, two guys come to mind immediately. Adrian Peterson, the running back for the Vikings, and uh, RG3, the quarterback for the Redskins, who probably will be back out on the field this fall. I mean, these are examples of two athletes that just a few years ago wouldn't have played for a good year, year and a half. Adrian Peterson came back and ran for over 2,000 yards. So now you've got more and more kids seeing, okay, I'm an athlete, okay, this is who I am, and in order to get back out there faster for my own expectations and also for my school and community, I might need to do what I need to do. And that's where this, this uh, growing issue, I think, of the pain medications come in. I really think there's a, there's a strong tie-in here. Some other things that uh, impact today's student athlete, just in general, sports burnout. Uh, we've got more kids today that specialize in one sport. They often uh, make this decision very early. I've seen kids as early as five, six, seven years old that have already identified this is a sport that they're going to do. They're going to do it year-round. So they become sports specialists. Uh, that's the other thing, the, the uh, playing sports year-round. And as you might imagine, um, we're seeing more and more kids that just get burned out from playing sports, and that's probably not something that you're surprised by. Uh, the third point has sports specialization. I don't know when exactly this started, but I know when I was in high school, and probably many of you, uh, kids generally played different sports per season, right? And again, now we're seeing uh, less of that. We're, in fact, I've seen even some articles over the years questioning where has the three-sport letter winner gone, because you don't see as many anymore. Uh, Year-round training, kind of talked about that. Uh, it's certainly not uncommon to see kids playing 10, 11, 12 months a year now. Travel leagues, you know, we're about to start summer. How many kids do you know that already had an intense uh, school year with their sport, and now they're going to start out whether it's soccer, baseball, softball, and they're going to play upwards of what, 40, 50, 60, 70 games this summer? I mean, you think about that, not only is that taxing on their bodies physically, but it's very taxing mentally and emotionally um, because they lose the fun part of it. You know, um, and, and the number one reason why kids play sports, if you look at any sports psychology survey out there, is what? Is to have fun. 
know. And so when we lose that and it becomes a business again, another part of this equation of being a student athlete today. Uh, and then the final point I have here is we're seeing more student athletes today with specialized training. Um, you know, I see kids come into my practice, sometimes uh, they'll sometimes have a practice in the morning, maybe one after school, and then after that practice they see a nutritionist, a sports psychologist, a, a skills person, a speed person, and, you know, before you know it, they're home 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night and their entire life is around athletics. So, um, now, I, I'm talking about the athlete in a general sense today just to kind of paint the picture and I don't want it to come across as a, as a negative picture there's some good involved too I mean we know a lot of research shows kids being involved in sports it provides them countless athletic transferable skills uh, it allows them to grow self-confidence it allows them to become better at multitasking organizing a schedule obviously there are physical benefits so it's not all bad but I think the point here is that what we're talking about in 2013 is probably different it's certainly different than 1983 or 1993, and you could probably make an argument very different than just 2003, even 10 years ago. Okay, so let's talk about some of the additional complexities for student athletes on the next slide. Uh, the pressures that kids face today, as I alluded to a moment ago, I think you're seeing more student athletes feel that both overtly, where coaches or their teammates will say, Hey, when are you playing again? You know, we need you. We're getting close to postseason. We need you back in the lineup. And then sometimes it's more covert, where you know nobody's really saying it directly, but there's clearly an expectation. Hey, you should be back out there again. The team's hurting without you. And so that kind of leaves these kids in a no no man's land of what do I need to do to more quickly get back out there? Because I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it for my team, for my school, for my community. And by the way, your athletics really does play a big part in, in the, um, <laughs> the attitude of your community. It's, it's interesting, I saw a research article a number of years ago and I often talk about it when I do these presentations because I think it really makes a good point. Um, the research team looked at the identity or the affiliation communities take with their sports teams. Now I don't know in recent years how many district or state championships you've won here, but I would be willing to bet when you guys have been successful, you have felt it in the community. There's probably been more of a presence and signage and attitudes have been good. Well, it's interesting because what these researchers did was they went to, um, they went to college campuses the day after a home football game, and they would randomly ask students walking across campus, how'd your team do last night? And when the home team won, they would say, we won, we beat them, we kicked their butts. But on the times where the home team lost, how do you think they responded? They lost. They lost, <laughs> they got beat up last night. So they depersonalized. So we know that's a really nice litmus test that shows uh, that your community really does pay attention to your athletics. And uh, obviously that in turn plays into some of the pressures that student athletes face. So you've got um, expectation of parents. Uh, we've got more and more parents today that think uh, their kid might have a shot at that full ride college athletic scholarship or maybe even beyond so they need that, that kid back out there playing they don't want to miss an opportunity where he or she might be showcased you need to be healthy and playing you've got expectations of school and community as we've been talking about depending on the program I uh, am in different schools across Ohio and sometimes even nationwide and certain schools are known <coughs> for certain sports right and so if you are a student athlete involved in that sport, you might even get more attention than you ever wanted because that's the sport that, that we're known for. Uh, there are expectations of being a leader and role model for kids today. Uh, and this is another complexity because in most schools there's very little, if any, actual role model slash leadership development. It's like we have these expectations for our student athletes to carry themselves right and make good decisions and, and live a good, clean life. But a lot of times we just leave it up to them to figure that out. We're not teaching them the skills that they need. Now, and that's sad because we miss important opportunities. I think that student athletes are clearly the most visible kids in any school system. That doesn't mean they're better or worse, but they're the most visible. And when they do things, good or bad, people pay attention, you know? And so I think that's another area, maybe for another day, we can talk about empowering kids through leadership. But, but this is another complexity for student athletes is learning that. You know, some kids are just really good at their sport and had no idea that they were going to be a role model while doing it. If some of you remember the old Charles Barkley commercial from probably 20 years ago now, do you remember that one? Yeah. 
I'm not a role model. You know, very controversial at the time. Uh, so then there are also expectations of balancing school, sports, and activities. So there's a lot on these kids' plates. Uh, and as a result, kids will face two types of stress. Student athletes face two kinds of stress as it applies to their life as a student athlete. So if they experience a, a, an injury that's going to keep them out for a while, that's usually what we call an acute stressor. It's in the here and now. It, you know, you have to deal with it on the spot. That one we all are aware of. Um, if you had traffic coming into work today, that would be an acute stressor. Usually that's a short-lived type of stress. The second type of stress that they also experience when dealing with injuries is what we call uh, chronic or cumulative stress. So here's a student athlete. Um, she's the best player on the team, and she's going to be out for a couple months for uh, an injury. You know, she has the pain and suffering of the injury when it occurred, but now she's got that chronic cumulative stress over the entire duration of the rehabilitation period. It's not being involved with her teammates, not traveling sometimes with the team if that coach doesn't have her involved, falling between the cracks, not really knowing what to talk about anymore. When she comes to class, the teacher doesn't ask her anymore how about the game last night. And now, you know, you can sit here as an adult and think, oh, that's not that big a deal, she get past it. But when you're that 15, 16, 17-year-old student athlete, and that, that was the attention you previously got, and now you feel as though no one's paying attention, I'm not really a part of the team. We also know that um, social support in general, when any of us are sick or, or injured or not feeling well, when we have people that are tuned into our better interests, the, the variable of social support is a mediating variable for healing. And what that means is just simply having people in your corner saying, keep it up, keep going, we, you know, we, we got your back, we're looking out for you. That in and of itself actually assists in the healing process. And as you can imagine, with student athletes, if, if he or she is not a part of the team anymore, you lose that. So there's a lot that goes on here. And again, I'm trying to set the table to where these student athletes are most at risk for turning to some of these substances to, to uh, mask the physical pain of the injury, but also to help with the coping. Uh, people turn to drugs and alcohol, uh, street drugs and alcohol, all the time as an effective way to deal with their stress. Now, now hear me out on this. It's effective in that you don't think about your problems when you're drunk or you're high. It's certainly not a healthy means for coping with stress, but the people why, uh, or the reason why people largely use drugs and alcohol is you don't think about your problems when you're under the influence. So, again, some of the factors here that lead uh, to the risks. We'll take a look at the next uh, slide, the impact of a sports injury. So here are some of the uh, characteristics of a sport-related injury. The first and foremost is probably something that you would have already imagined, uh, the physical pain associated with the injury. Uh, but interestingly, that is the lesser of the two. It's typically more the mental and emotional anguish that athletes in general, not just kids that we're talking about in schools, even pro athletes, uh, struggle a lot more with the mental emotional anguish than they do the physical pain. Typically, the physical pain subsides pretty quickly, uh, but what happens after that? Some of those things we just talked about. So you've got um, the physical pain. We also have uh, something that's true today that wasn't a generation ago. In the old days, if an athlete were injured, uh, he or she would never lose their starting position. <laughs> that's not always the case. Now, some coaches still hold on to that, but we're seeing more coaches today, if a kid is injured, Oh well, you know, the next kid who's ready plays, and when that uh, injured athlete's ready to come back, he or she has to earn that spot again. Now again, you may have differing uh, views on that, but I know uh, that's different today than what it used to be. So we have more kids now worried about losing their starting position. That puts them at risk to using whatever they need to do to cope with the pain and get back out there. Um, you also have the potential loss of a future college scholarship. We sometimes see, it's rare, but we sometimes see kids as early as 8th, ninth grade being offered college athletic scholarships these days. This process starts very early. Um, you know, if you're a sophomore, junior in high school right now and you don't have your summer schedule plotted out with your camps and clinics and getting exposed to coaches, you're behind. <laughs> you are behind. So those pressures of, of earning that college athletic scholarship start earlier and earlier. And again, another one of these pressures that leaves kids exposed. Uh, we also have the mental, uh, emotional issues, including anxiety and depression. You know, for most of the kids who have a sport-related injury, if it's a serious one, they probably have not experienced it before. 
They don't know what a torn ACL is until they have that. Uh, and a lot of times, finding good information is difficult. Even with the internet today, which makes it easier, finding good information is sometimes challenging, good, credible information. So a lot of times, kids suffer with anxiety. Uh, they don't know when they're going to be back out there again. Sometimes they struggle with mood disorders, being depressed from the injury. And then finally, uh, I've kind of already talked about it, so I'll go quickly, that athletic identity. Uh, if they're no longer in uniform, they're no longer part of the team, they lose that, uh, even if it's a temporary loss, it, it can be uh, a real difficult process for a student athlete to, to find out who he or she is without their sport. When you think about today's kids, and, and I mean think about the kids here at the school, how many of these kids started playing their sport at four, five, six years old? You know, organized sports. You know, you don't see as many, you know, pickup games at the Sandlot or backyard football. It is organized, and, and it is their, you know, who they are from a very early age. So, okay, uh, so I'd like to take a look at the next slide. There is a medical paradox. Now, I'm going to step away from sports for a moment and talk about the medical paradox. If you are someone who watches television or reads magazines, you don't need me to tell you that we have become a pill society. <laughs> if you watch TV tonight, you will see numerous commercials telling you that there is a pill for every ache, woe, pain, problem, anything you're dealing with. Don't worry about dusting yourself off and learning resiliency. There's a pill for that. And, and that's the generation we've got today. And I hate to sound jaded about it because I'm not anti-medicine, but I am anti-trying. And I think that a lot of these medications for all kinds of different uh, problems and disorders are uh, new to market. We don't have longitudinal research of 30 or 40 years. Uh, there's sometimes controversies about how quickly some of these medications come to market. And, but this is what kids see today. Uh, this is what kids are growing up to see that if they have an issue, they have a problem, that inevitably there will be some type of medication, something that they can take orally that will make their problems go away. Uh, now, there is a paradox here, <laughs> and, and that paradox is that quite often the very same medications that we as people are prescribed um, often bring along with them different side effects and interaction effects and withdrawal effects. In fact, oftentimes if you look at a, a medication bottle, you will see a black box with warnings there. Or if you're watching TV, it's all those words that go really fast at the bottom of the screen that you can't read. Uh, ironically enough, and being someone uh, who works in mental health, many times the symptoms that, that people describe are in fact the black box warnings from the medications and not the disorder itself. So it's a paradox here. You know, so you've got, say, a kid dealing with depression because he's out for a while instead of going to counseling or seeking some other non-invasive approaches to help him, immediately someone put him on an antidepressant or two, and now all of a sudden he's displaying some of the symptoms, but they're not symptomatic of the depression, they're actually symptomatic of the medication that he's taking. So, again, this really makes it difficult. And then you throw into the fact, we're talking about kids here today, uh, they're still growing. You know, they're going through puberty, their bodies are developing. So you're mixing the chemistry up here, and as you can see, again, it becomes quite the paradox. Um, and we can go on and on about different approaches, and we won't do that today, but I guess the point here, and, and it's, I'm going to get into this in, in a few slides, is that we really need to be critical thinking. And I think if you work with families on the front line, or you have kids in your school system that you suspect, or you know, that are using uh, you know, pain pill medications or other medications that you think could be dangerous, it's important to have conversation around this. Rather than just sit passively and think, well, the doctor prescribed it, it must be good. Now, now don't take me the opposite here. I'm not suggesting that you should be paranoid of physicians or anything like that. But I am saying you should be involved in the process. You should be active. You should be asking questions. You should have specific targets and goals, and we'll get to that with the advice today. Uh, but you need to stay close to the process. If you're a teacher, a counselor, somebody who works with kids, uh, and, you, and you have access to that family, encourage them, empower them to be a part of the process, and not just sit idle and take whatever people tell them they should do. Because I'll tell you, what happens, um, there's a lot of variables that influence this, and sometimes it's just other kids in your community. When increasingly more kids are, are put on different medications, there's studies out there that show that when families go to their primary care physician and ask for a medication, they're granted it based on their own just asking. 
You know, hey, this, this family down the street, this kid's suffering from the same thing my kid is. What do you think, doc? And doctors know that if they tell this family, well, you know, this child needs to be exercising, join a support group, get some individual counseling, they know that that family will walk out feeling like they got their, their money taken from them. Because the expectation is, here's a prescription pad and here is a medication. So, you know, these are some of the things that we're all up against when we're trying to help kids and their families make good decisions on the front end so that we have fewer of these issues to, to respond to on the back end. Um, the next slide is uh, the quest to reduce pain from, from the injury. And, you know, I have this behind me, this risk reward. So here we are, we've got student athletes who just by being involved in athletics, part and parcel with sports, they're going to experience injuries, right? I mean, that's the nature of sports. We know that that's going to happen. The question then becomes, where do we find that delicate balancing point where what we are suggesting that the youngster do uh, takes care of the pain in the least dangerous, least intrusive ways? Putting a student athlete immediately on some high-powered opiate based pain pill medication is probably not the first step in the vast majority of bumps and bruises. Uh, now you would have to have other uh, medical physicians here to talk about when they go to that level, but I can tell you for you know a sprain, strain, a bump, a bruise, you shouldn't be going to that level of aggressiveness with respect to medicinal treatment. But that's what we have here. You know, we have this question of how do you balance risk versus reward? How do we provide to student athletes some means to cope with their physical pain, but do so in a way that allows them to manage that pain in safe ways? And there are different means of doing that. I'll talk about in a slide coming up. Uh, it's not all about just numbing the pain uh, through, through pain medications. Now, that's the physical side of it. Then you've got, again, the mental, emotional side. And I will say at this point, too, I know it's not on the slide, but I do want to mention it. Increasingly more clinicians, statewide, nationwide, are uh, becoming experts in the field of sports psychology. Even if they don't have a sport psychology practice, you're starting to see more people, see student athletes, recognizing that student athletes do, in fact, have their own unique issues and concerns and problems it would be very wise to start to build relationships in your community and if you don't have people right here in this community who are the contiguous counties around here that you can become familiar with uh, I think it's really important to have these people their names and number on file uh, maybe even reach out to them sometime during the school year and introduce yourself get to know a little bit about their practice so that you can refer to them and feel comfortable in that. Uh, as I said, you've got the physical pain, that's part of it, but you've got this mental emotional pain. And if a kid is really struggling there and doesn't feel that he or she has anybody that really understands what's going on and leaves them at risk to doing things, um, could be using recreational drugs to, to cope with that pain uh, of the, the mental side. So something to think about there. Uh, on the next slide, I want to talk just briefly about some of the unseen psychological variables that lead to false safety. Do I have any previous psychology majors from college in here? No? Okay. Okay. Well, I want to talk about two really interesting and fascinating studies uh, that show that we can be persuaded uh, to things against our will, and none of us like to admit this. But when I tell you about these studies, you'll see that really we're all at risk for this. Um, the first has to do with uh, Stanley Milgram and the shock treatments. Have you heard of, uh, you've heard of Stanley Milgram? Okay. I was a psychology major. Okay, so you remember a little, a little bit about this? Um, <laughs> Milgram wanted to see, he wanted to test the lengths of blind obedience. How far would people go even knowing that they were hurting someone else if they were merely suggested to keep going by an authority figure. So the way they set this up, and you can look on Google and there's videos out there, it's really fascinating. Um, Dr. Milgram brought people in and told them that they were participating in a memory study, and this was back in the 1960s, and they were put in front of an electrical shock panel, and they were told that they were to ask questions, and there was a learner on the other side of a wall, 
And for each wrong question that the learner uh, answered, the, the teacher had to deliver a shock. And if you watch the video, you can actually see the instrument panel of increasingly stronger shocks. The very last button, I'll never forget, has XXX on it. I mean, so they make it as vivid as possible that you are actually going to hurt someone for answering a question wrong. Now, of course, there was never anybody hooked up to this device, so no one really got shocked. And ahead of time, uh, the researchers hypothesized that nobody would do that. You know, the first time they, even if they'd even get to the point of delivering one shock, the first time they'd push a button and hear a shock and hear somebody scream from behind the wall, people would quit, right? I mean, who would continue to do this? Well, as you might have figured out, they learned that more than two-thirds of the subjects not only participated, but went all the way to the very end. And if you watch the video, it, it's, it's really unbelievable because you will see some of these subjects actually shaking, sweating, you will hear a scream from the other side of the wall. So these people were absolutely led to believe that they were harming someone. Now, the key to this study was uh, Dr. Milgram and his team, they dressed the part. They wore white lab coats, they went by the title of doctor, and so the subjects afterwards said, you know, I just figured I was supposed to do this. That's what the doctor said. The doctor wouldn't allow me to hurt someone. Now, how's that play into modern times? Doctors out there that might be quick to prescribe. Who's critically thinking, whoa, that's a pretty aggressive first step for, you know, a, a sore elbow. <laughs> you know, we need to be critical thinking. We can't just sit back. And again, I want to stress, I'm not saying that there are bad, crooked doctors out there. But there are doctors that are more quick to prescribe. And, and we know that. Not just here in Ohio, but nationwide. So we need to be a lot more uh, attentive to these covert variables of how many of us just lower our guard. By the way, this is not true for just medicine. Uh, if you know nothing about cars and your auto mechanic comes out and tells you, you know, hold, holding some wires that you need new wires, <laughs> you're going to believe them, right? Uh, if you're not savvy with technology and your IT person looks at the computer and says you need a new hard drive, how many of us are going to question that? We tend to just assume that what experts say is true. So that's the first one. Uh, it's a really powerful and important psychological study that I think helps us understand how many families just passively go with the flow and before you know it, they've got a youngster who's addicted to a medication. Uh, the second one, the study here, uh, if you see behind me, these lines. This study was done by Solomon Ash and uh, it was interested in looking at the effects of groups and how we could be persuaded uh, by those around us. Now, we would all like to think that we are completely devoid of these influences, right? I mean, we think for ourselves, and we would never do something just because everyone around us is doing it. Well, interestingly, uh, that doesn't bear out in research. And if you look at these lines, you will see that uh, the way this test was set up, you have one line on the left, X, and then you have three lines on the right, A, B, and C. Now, if I were to ask you what line on the right is the same length as line X, what would you say? Pretty obvious. Okay. Now, the way they set this study up was really ingenious. Everybody in the classroom was in on the study, except one person, you. And they went around the room and they asked each student in the classroom that same question. What line on the right is the same length as the line on the left? And every person answered one of the other choices. So they might have answered A or C. So now after you've heard 15, 20 people say that, it comes around to you. What are you going to answer? Again, more than two-thirds of the subjects answered the wrong line simply to stay kosher with everybody else in the classroom. So we know that even in research studies where it's painfully obvious the length of a line that people will, will answer against their better judgment to just keep everything status quo. Again, how does this play out today? You know, think about kids and where their influences come from. If there's another kid on one of the teams who's using a medication, abusing a medication, you know, do they start to be influenced by some of those, those peers and make decisions that even they know probably isn't the best decision, but you know, half the team's using this, so maybe it's okay after all. It's easy to convince yourself of these things. So, uh, again, I present these because these are some of the variables that we don't see on the surface. 
We don't see how malleable our thinking can be, at least we don't want to admit to it, and we certainly, uh, I don't think prior to Milgram's work, would have ever thought that people could go to such lengths of actually thinking they're physically harming someone just to uh, obey an authority figure. Okay, so we'll turn to the next slide. Uh, some general comments about stress, because stress obviously plays into a sport-related injury, and it also leaves kids very exposed, again, to, to some of these medications. So what do we know about stress? Um, a couple things. These are general uh, thoughts. First, as I said earlier, we know that both prescription and recreational drugs do provide a respite from stress. So if you've got a student athlete who's really stressed out about his or her injury, we know that if they're drinking, using street drugs, or prescription drugs, it's going to provide a respite from that. Again, that doesn't make it good or right, but we know that it works in that fashion. There's also an inverse relationship between stress and control. So think about how this plays out in your life. If you're under a lot of stress right now, chances are you probably feel a little out of control. That doesn't mean that you're bad or that your life's messed up or anything, but we all have those times during the year, right, where we've got 10 balls in the air and you feel like you can't control anything, so you're stressed out. Um, when we feel that we're in control, ironically, we have less stress. And, and the interesting thing here is they've even looked at research studies where people just have a sense of control. Even when they're not, but they feel they're in control, they still feel less stressed. So, you know, with our student athletes, when they have an injury, they don't know the nature of the injury, they don't know how quickly they'll be back, they don't know when the pain's going to go away. All these questions, again, they're, they're losing control. And that puts them in a very stressful spot. And again, how they cope with stress, we, we've talked about that. A couple other factors that help, and this is something that you can share with student athletes. Uh, I think it's important that, that we, as the, the teachers, counselors, people who work with kids understand this, and then impart this upon kids, because they can get what I'm about to say here. We know that predictability, control, and optimism can really help, especially student athletes going through an injury. So, um, predictability. You know, can you work in conjunction with the physician or the trainer or others in the know with talking about some of the things that are likely to occur in the future. So if you've got a kid suffering from a serious injury, can you help impart upon him or her some of the points in the next couple weeks that are going to be coming up? You're going to need to see the doctor. The, the start of your training is going to be especially tough. When you get those stitches out, it's going to be sore. You know, the more that we can help them predict, they're gaining a sense of control. That's very important. We also know that, um, as I've talked about control, the more that they can control putting them in charge of the process, helping them write out goals, post those goals, follow the goals, um, you know, talking maybe to other student athletes who have experienced similar uh, athletic injuries. You might even have some alumni at your school who um, you know, also lost some time years ago. You find that people are very open to helping uh, kids you know, with these issues, so think about that. And then finally, optimism. You know, optimism is not something that you're born with. Um, you can become a more optimistic person. Okay, we're not born optimistic or pessimistic. So, you know, again, it's, it's how much we want to give of ourselves as teachers, counselors, parents. Uh, you know, what efforts do we want to make to help inspire kids to be optimistic about, okay, you're going to be out for three months, but you got summer ball, you got next year. You know, keeping their spirits high, again, that will really help them through this process as well as ward off the, the likelihood that they might get caught up in prescription or recreational drugs. And then finally, the uh, last point is, is bold for a reason. The key is to help student athletes manage the injury pain and accompany stress in healthy and safe ways. You know, that's the key. How do we help them navigate through this unknown? You know, they, they haven't been here before, they don't know what it's like to not be a part of the team, maybe losing a future college athletic scholarship, what can we do so that they are coping in healthy and effective and safe ways? All right, so these last couple slides, and then uh, I'll open this up for, for questions. These have to do with warning signs and then things that you can do, tips and, and ways you can respond. So we'll go to the next uh, slide. These are the warning signs for student athletes who are most at risk for uh, becoming dependent on pain pill medications. Um, so first, kids with a high degree of athletic identity. I mean, that should be no surprise. If you are in the classroom, or you're a counselor here, or you work with student athletes, it's pretty obvious, if you're looking for it, it's pretty obvious the kids who overly identify with athletics. 
They don't even think about plan B, C, or D. It is, I am going to play college and one day pro sports. And that's fine. Nobody's here to discourage their dreams. But we all know that it's just prudent as people to always have a backup plan in life. Especially with sports. Every athlete is one career-ending injury away from being over. So athletes especially need to have plans beyond just plan A of playing college sports. So if you see a kid who every single day is in his junior high or high school athletic gear from head to toe, every conversation that he has is about athletics, every summer plan is sports, I mean again, those are flags. And it doesn't mean that that kid's going to have a tough life or he's going to be a failure, but what it does mean is if he has an injury, especially one that's long term, he is going to be a very high risk candidate for all kinds of things that, that can really uh, cause bigger problems than, than healing the injury itself. Student-athletes with hopes or expectations of earning a college athletic scholarship. Again, kind of goes hand-in-hand hand with the athletic identity, but we know that if kids are banking on it, and let's face it, there are kids nationwide that they see that as their ticket out, right? Uh, they might come from a tough background. This is their way out of that. Again, they're putting everything on that. They know they need to get, out, get back out there quicker. And so then again, they see Adrian Peterson, RG3, they see these other athletes, you know, getting back out there, not to imply that those athletes used, um, you know, prescription pain medications, or I don't know what they did, but the point is, they saw how quick they got back out there. And so these kids start to think, I need to do what I need to do to get out there. Uh, a third warning sign, student athletes with unrealistic expectations for quickly rebounding from the injury. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, a torn ACL. You don't see people coming back within a month from a torn ACL. Uh, now, medicine is advancing. We're seeing people get back out quicker, but you're still looking at a good year in most cases. Uh, you know, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, Tommy John surgery for any of the baseball people. You know, if a, if a pitcher had Tommy John surgery, that was could be career ending, really, if you think about it. Um, best case scenario is going to be a year to two years before you got out there again. Now, we've even seen some reports of, of pitchers getting this procedure done before they have a problem to strengthen their arm to ward off uh, that, that damage that comes from that. So, you know, it's, it's a different day and age for sure. Uh, and then finally, student athletes who suddenly develop new peer groups or engage in atypical behaviors. Um, you know, again, this should be no surprise here, but if you're seeing things that are uncharacteristic, if you're seeing that student athlete, uh, befriending and hanging around kids who you know are, are probably not good for him or her. Maybe they already have been in trouble before for um, you know, drug or alcohol violations. Again, you, you, you know, want to pay attention to that. Those are certainly some warning signs of a student athlete who might be involved with um, some, some prescription medications or worse yet, street drugs, especially heroin, again, because of its addictive qualities. And then finally, our, our last slide. Uh, tips and strategies. I thought we'd talk about this uh, for a few minutes and then open it up to questions that you have. Um, tips and strategies. Um, you know, the first thing that I would remind us all, again, is that this is a growing problem. Um, it, it's not just going to go away tomorrow. Uh, we are going to see more of it in the future, probably going to see a lot more of it before it starts to take a dip. There's always that lag time behind, you know, when something develops versus the, the protocols and the educational efforts that follow. So, you know, we're still ascending here. And so I think for that reason, it's very important that we're proactive and that we really do all that we can, and we're trying on the state level, and we hope locally as well, you know, having in-house seminars, talking to your school psychologists, counselors, talking to your coaches, and selling them on this being important. You know, I know that there's a lot of training requirements for interscholastic coaches today, and in some cases, these coaches look at it as punitive, that they have to go to these in-service uh, seminars. But, you know, I think it's, it's our job, again, as leaders, people in the school, to sell the message that this is important, this is not punitive. You know, if you've had even one kid in your school system go down this dark road, it's one too many. And so I think it's really important that we all engage in, in strategic educational efforts to raise awareness. Secondly, I think it's important to encourage coaches to acquire training around dangers of prescription pain pills and in turn talk to their teams. So it's one thing to provide the information to them, but I would recommend that they go beyond that. Um, I know here in Ohio, coaches are required to have preseason meetings with parents. That's something that we started a few years ago. Nationwide, I don't know, you know how the other states look at this, but I would certainly encourage coaches 
to talk about this, not just hold this information to themselves and look for signs, but to be open about it. Talk to the kids on their teams about the dangers, talk to parents at that preseason parent meeting that this is something that uh, no family ever thinks they're going to deal with, but there are many families dealing with it, and, and they never thought that it would be them. And, and you know, before you know it, it has happened. So I think it's important to, to talk. Third, uh, I've already talked about this, never blindly trust your physicians or your caregivers. Um, you don't have to be paranoid, you certainly should not be jaded toward their approaches, but you should be active and involved, and families need to know this. They need to ask questions, they need to um, have better understanding of what is being prescribed to their son or daughter, they need to be involved in the process. It's absolutely inexcusable to just sit back and whatever happens, happens. I'm totally putting my trust into this uh, physician or whoever that person is. We have to do better than that. And so it's important to, to have those conversations. Uh, number four, in, encourage exploration of other pain management ideas. There are other means for managing pain. And I have a few of these on the uh, slide here. Imagery, deep breathing, Self-talk, progressive muscle relaxation. Again, these are all different psychological tools um, using imagery to manage pain. There are different uh, methods in which uh, a student athlete can um, take a break, relax, close his or her eyes, think of a calming setting. Uh, it really does work. Imagery can be very, very powerful. Um, breathing, using deep breathing all the way into the stomach, not just here in the chest, but using deep breathing can relax uh, and can bring an arousal system down. Uh, self-talk, you know, just staying positive, uh, engaging in productive self-talk. I'm going to get through this. Other athletes have had this injury and they've gotten through it. Again, there's so much that we can do that has no risk to it. You know, there are no side effects to a, a student athlete using imagery, deep breathing, and positive self-talk. Or, if you're going to go the route of pain medication, you know, families should be having the conversation, what's the, the lowest pill available? You know, what's the lowest milligram amount that we can try? Let's start there. You know, again, that would wipe out so many of these future problems. Uh, the fifth point, help student-athlete develop specific, measurable, controllable goals during the rehabilitation process. If you go back to what I talked about earlier, the more they control, the less stress they're going to experience. So if there's an injury, you know, student athletes can easily be taught how to sit down, write specific goals of when they will be able to do certain things again, uh, whether it's a weight room, cardio work, uh, they should be able to measure those goals, they should keep track of those goals in a journal so they can see their progress. Again, all of this is empowering. The more they feel in control, the more confident they are in the process, the less likely they're going to turn to anything, street or prescription drugs. They're just not going to need it. They are in control of the process. So that's very powerful. And then uh, the last two points, um, keep the injured athlete a part of the team. You know, some coaches do a really good job of this and, and others not so good. Um, and I think the coaches who don't do a good job of it, it's not that they're bad coaches. I think they just overlook, you know, they forget. Uh, they're focused on the game plan and the kids that are playing, so I don't want to make it sound like they're bad coaches. But you also see some coaches who do it really well, and some coaches make it a point to, to keep injured athletes as part of the team, travel with the team, give them different responsibilities at practice so they're still involved. I'll tell you, that is huge. Not only does it help the student athletes stay a part of the team, but it also provides some structure. And let's face it, when you've got nothing but time on your hands, it's where we as human beings get into trouble. And so when a student athlete um, you know, goes to school up till 3, 3.30, goes to practice, even if he or she's not playing, they're still a part of it. Maybe they're just bringing out the equipment or breaking down the equipment, just involved in it. When they're traveling to the games, Again, that provides that structure that they're accustomed to, and it leaves them a lot less time to, to possibly get involved in other bad things. And then finally, uh, the last point, uh, I mentioned this earlier too, explore mental health options. Uh, this is a different day and age. Now, I realize that there is still a stigma uh, for young people, for people of all ages, I guess, uh, that if you're seeing some kind of mental health psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, what have you, uh, that there are problems and you know the people still you know want to keep it low-key that they're working with someone but I will tell you I think that's changing I really do I think that's changing I think increasingly more student-athletes are seeing that pro and college athletes 
um, regularly see counselors or support psychologists, people who can help them, because they realize they've got unique issues. Uh, you know, student athletes today have very unique issues for all the reasons I talked about today. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're bad or unhealthy or mentally ill, but they've got um, situations that other students might not have. You know, that athletic identity, college scholarship, a career ending injury. These are things that typically your, your average student here won't deal with unless he or she's involved in athletics. So, you know, think about how you can integrate holistic approaches, not just working, working on the injury level, but also on the mental and emotional side, because the stronger we keep kids there, again, the less likely they are to engage in any um, negative behaviors, whether that's pain pills or some of the other reckless behaviors that, that we all are exposed to when dealing with a lot of stress. So, uh, so those are some, I guess, ideas around how to, to um, help with the situation. Gone through a lot of content, a lot of material here at this point. If uh, you guys have questions, want uh, to go a little deeper with any of it, I'm, I'm happy to do that.